as I said, this is week four of Love Does. And for those who may be visiting, uh, if you're unfamiliar with Love Does, it's a, the, the, the book Love Does is writ, was written by Bob Goff. It's a New York Times bestseller. And uh, there's a life group program that goes along with it. I know many of you are doing that. Others are just reading the book. Maybe others are catching the sermons. And I know some of you are catching them online as well. The whole intent of this service, or of, of this series rather, is to take Jesus' life and the example of how Jesus loved, and for us as Christians to love others like that. But beyond that, there's another message, and that is the fact that I just believe, and the Bible tells us, how God wants us, and Jesus came to give us a richer, fuller life. Jesus didn't die. God didn't create a perfect world and then send Jesus in to save it so that we could just have ordinary run-of-the-mill lives, did he? I don't think God wants us to just have a life like the rest of the world. Just an ordinary life. I believe he wants us to have a relationship and a life that is extraordinary. That God has something special in store for his people. You agree with that? Yeah. The reality is, not everybody experiences that, do they? Even his own people don't always experience that. We're going to unpack that a little bit this morning. But to prove biblically that that's what God wants, I look at John 10.10. 10, and look at the words of that text with me from the New Living Translation. It says, a thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. Who is that thief? The devil. That's his purpose. Do you think the devil is alive and well in the world today? Do you think he's working overtime? Yeah. And do you think that God wants his people to be consumed by a thief who wants to kill, destroy, and ruin things? No. You read the second part of the text, and it says, but my purpose, Jesus' words, but my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying Life. The New King James says, an abundant life. Abundant blessings filling over. Peterson in the message says this, a thief is only there to steal, kill, and destroy. I came so that they can have real and eternal life, a more and better life than they ever dreamed of. When I look at that text, would you agree with me that God didn't create, he doesn't, doesn't desire for his people just to have an ordinary life, he wants them to have an extraordinary life? Something special in store. God has a purpose for you and I. And the older I get, and sometimes lately I'm feeling pretty old, especially when I got to spend 45 minutes shoveling because the snowblower is broke. But the older I get, the more I realize that God isn't finished with me yet. There's rarely a, a, a day or a week that goes by when I don't think that God is trying to teach me something. Now, one of the questions I should be asking is, are we teachable? <laughs> How teachable are you? I don't want to go there this morning. But my, my, my point in saying this is that God isn't finished with us yet. We're not there yet. We have a profession of faith class that's going to meet again after the service this morning. When you make profession of faith or when you make a commitment to follow Christ, that is not the end. It's the beginning. It's the beginning. It's nothing more than a rest stop on the road in our life, but a rest stop where we stop and we say, I'm putting God first, and I'm going to allow him to take over my life, give him control of my life. Whoa, that's big. That's big. But I believe that unless we do that, unless we realize that he's in control and we need to have that surrender, unless we're willing to be teachable and unless we're willing to deal with some things, we'll never experience that richer, fuller life as long as we're in control. The richer, fuller life comes when we realize who's in control and that he's not finished with us. Now I could say... That person 
is a piece of work. You could take that one way. <laughs> That's a piece of work. Or I could say that we're all pieces of work. We're all pieces of clay, pieces of work in God's hands, aren't we? And he's not finished with us yet. He is not finished with us yet. Listen to these words from Philippians 1, verse 6. It says, I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ returns. Isn't that a biblical proof text that God's not finished with us yet? He who began a good work is going to carry it through to completion. I like how Peterson paraphrases this. He says, there's never been the slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in you would keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish. There's that abundant life, the extraordinary life on the very day that Christ Jesus appears. This is a really simple message this morning. There's nothing complicated about what I'm going to say. The difficulty is applying it. So I want you to take some notes this morning. You may get done and you may say, well, that wasn't a very deep sermon. I don't want it to be deep because deep gets complicated and confusing. I want you to understand it. Let me say this. One of the reasons that I think we miss the life that God intends for us to move from ordinary to extraordinary, we're held back because of fear. We're held back because of fear. Fear is a four-letter word <laughs> that often stops us dead in our tracks. And if not dead in our tracks, fear certainly will slow us down, rattle us, scare us, or keep us from even getting on the track. This morning, when I think about fear, I want to share some things that I think we're all afraid of. I think you can all relate to some of these things. I think of the kids this morning or those who are in school. At school, there's a fear of failure, isn't there? What if I'm not the smartest person in my class? I graduated in the part of the class that made the top 98% possible. Think about that. I wasn't the sharpest pencil. As a matter of fact, I didn't have a pencil in my drawer half the time. I probably spent two-thirds of second grade in the hallway or the principal's office. I was scared to death of exams. I would say there will always be prayer in school as long as there are exams in school. But I was deathly afraid of gym class because I was a scrawny little kid that couldn't even dribble a basketball. I was the one who was always picked last. Nobody wanted me, but somebody got me. Scared to death going through school. I think some of us are afraid at work. For one, will we have our job a year from now? Will our job look different than it is now? What if we get a new boss? What if we get a new coworker? What if the policy changes? What if we're sold? I think some people are scared of maybe a new vocation in life. Now that's different than a job. You can go to a job, but a vocation is a calling, isn't it? Lots of people go to work, but aren't necessarily called to that work. And they're scared when they feel a calling to a vocation that's going to require some different dynamics. I think a lot of people fear their health. Ooh. Yeah? Especially as you start getting older. What's it going to look like? You know, I get to go to the hospital a lot. And I see lots of things and I just think, wow, could that be me? Could that happen to me? What's my health going to look like? Maybe we fear dying. Maybe not so much what happens when we die, especially if we're in Christ, right? We shouldn't fear that. But sometimes we fear how we might die. 
what's my death going to look like? This is an encouraging message, by the way. We fear our finances, don't we? Too much month at the end of the money, the country song says. Maybe not enough money when it's time to retire. Or what about this nest egg that we saved and the stock market crashes again? I used to work with a guy and he said he feared two things in life, snakes and prisons. Honestly, I don't care for either one of them either. Sometimes I think we're afraid of being alone, aren't we? Or we're afraid of being alone in the dark. And speaking of dark, maybe we're even afraid that we have a second life. There are people who have a hidden life. And if that became exposed and out of the dark, they're afraid of what that might look like, fear of being discovered. There's lots of things to be afraid of, isn't there? Aren't there? I think if I asked every one of you what you're afraid of, it wouldn't take you too long to say, I'm afraid of this or that. We'd come up with a list. In preparing for this this past week, I came across some sayings. Google's an awesome thing. That wasn't one of the sayings. That was my saying. But one of the things, well, some of the things I came across this week were these when I, when I Googled fear. Fear is a mind killer. It's a little death that brings about total obliteration. Fear. Another one was where fear is present, wisdom cannot be. It says fear is a liar. And I've shared that one with you a number of times. I always look at fear as saying false evidence appearing real. Danger is real, but fear is a choice. I really like this next one. A life lived in fear is a life half lived. Now we're getting back to the biblical text that fear holds us back. Another one is life is a battle. Fear is the enemy. But what does fear look like? Here's a picture of fear. You get it? We're trapped. Fear just sort of traps us, doesn't it? One of the things I want you to understand this morning is every one of us probably has a fear of one kind or another. You can jot this down. Fear does not come from God. The enemy who is the thief, steal, and destroy, one of the ways he steals and destroys the life that we are to inherit for belonging to Christ is he allows fear or plants fear within us. Fear does not come from God. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, New, Trans Living, Trans New Living Translation says this, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. These words from Romans 8 verse 15, it says, You did not receive a, a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. Here's how Peterson paraphrases that. He says, this resurrection life you received from God is not timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously. Do you see the extraordinary when you look at that word? Adventure. Life is to be an adventure. It's a journey. And he says, it's adventurously expectant, greeting God with a child like, what's next, Papa? God's Spirit touches our hearts and confirms who we really are. We know who He is, and we know who we are, father and children, and we know we are going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. I want you to look at a text this morning, and then I want to give you several things about fear. You can call them fear factors if you want to this morning. But let's look at this text before I give you those. If you're new and you're visiting, you can go to uversion.com. And just go to live events for our zip code here for Byron Center, which is 49315, I think. And all of this stuff will be there, the text and notes and so forth. And you can write notes in there, uversion.org. Jesus walks on water, Mark 6, 45 through 52. And I want you to listen to the fear among the disciples who were with Jesus. It says, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and head across the lake to Bethsaida while he sent the people home. Now, they had just gotten done feeding 5,000 people. It's the end of the day. They've been with Jesus. They saw the miracle. And Jesus sends them out on the water. After telling everyone goodbye, he went up into the hills and he tells himself, or he goes himself to pray. Late that night, the disciples were in their boat in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on land. 
He saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. He intended to go past them, but when they saw him walking on the water, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. They were all terrified when they saw him. But Jesus spoke to them at once, don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I'm here. Then he climbed into the boat, and the wind stopped, and they were totally amazed. Several factors about fear. Number one, fear is powerful. Fear is powerful. Fear will grow. Fear will build fear. There is power when we are afraid. When I looked at the story here, it says the disciples, they were gripped in fear, weren't they? I can picture the disciples out there on the water because I remember when I was in college, my boss had a big sailboat and he took me out on Lake Michigan one day and lo and behold, that afternoon there was a huge storm that came up. Now, not only was I not a good athlete in school, but I'm a terrible swimmer. And he said, you need to go and take the sail down in the front of the boat while I sit back here. It's a good thing the water was splashing because I think my pants were. (sighs) Scared to death. I thought I was going to end up on the shore of Lake Michigan in Saugatuck. I get a little bit of a feeling for maybe what the disciples were going through at 3 o'clock in the morning when the wind and the waves were against them. And they were rowing as hard as they could and they thought maybe this was going to be it. And Jesus wasn't with them. Fear doesn't just take place in the mind, does it? If you've ever been afraid, oh, ticker, doesn't it? You ever have a panic attack? You wake up in the middle of the night, boom, 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 boom. Yeah, fear isn't just a mind thing. It's a whole body thing. People will wake up in fear and have a a a panic attack, and they will literally be wringing wet with sweat, won't they? Fear can consume us. It's powerful. When I'm reading this text here today, but last week or two weeks ago, we looked at it from Matthew. We looked at it in Matthew 14, and we look at Peter. Peter was in that story. Peter's not in this story, but when Peter was walking on water, what happened to Peter when he started getting out and walking on the water and looking at the wind and the waves? He was afraid, wasn't he? text says that. Peter was afraid, and he started sinking. Here's some more things about the power of fear. It stifles our thinking and our actions. And we can get so caught up in the power of fear that we don't recognize God when we're overcome by fear, nor do we recognize God when he shows up. They were so caught up in the fear out on the lake that when Jesus showed up, they thought it was a ghost, didn't they? Fear is powerful. When we have fear, fear holds us back. Fear takes over the brain and we begin to think differently. We become consumed by the fear. When we become afraid, we start thinking about, oh, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's not going to happen? What am I going to miss? Panic. Fear leaves us indecisive. We can't make a decision because we're afraid of making a good decision or a bad decision. And when fear sets in, it's dominated often by negative thoughts. We doubt ourselves. We doubt others. Or we doubt what God is doing in that. Fear, number two, weakens our potential. Kind of ties in with number one, but it weakens our potential. When we start to doubt, we begin to question our own abilities or God's abilities, don't we? We begin to really start wondering, and the indecision sets in. We'll move right on to number three. Not only does it weaken our potential, but number three, fear keeps you from becoming the person God wants you to be. You want me to get personal with that one? Fear robs you of the life God wants to give you. I think that's worth going back and pondering. Fear can rob us of the life God wants to give us. It's fear that downplays or ignores the nudge when God calls us to something greater. It's fear that says, I don't know enough about this. I don't have the education. I don't have the experience. I don't have the credentials, God. You can't possibly be wanting me to do that. 
Because I fear I'm going to sink if you have me do that. I know nothing about this. It's fear that says, I don't have the money, the time, or the talent. And we get caught up in the fear instead of caught up in the scriptures that says we can do all things through him who gives us strength. Yeah, it's fear that says, I don't have the energy. It's fear that says, I don't want to go there and do this because I got hurt last time. We talked about that last week or week before. Fear of getting hurt again. But if we're not willing to take the risk, we also don't live full lives, do we? It's fear that can drive people to destructive habits like drugs or alcohol. Self-medicate to get rid of the fear. It's fear that steals our peace and contentment. It's fear that keeps us in the boat in the harbor. When God made the sailboat to go out on the sea. Right? I'll never forget that day out in Lake Michigan off of Saugatuck. What if I would have just stayed in the harbor that day? That wouldn't have been any fun. I got a story to tell out of it. But I think that's what happens to us sometimes. We're afraid to leave the harbor. We're tied to the dock when God wants to give us the adventurous, abundant life. It's fear that keeps us in the boat. Fear keeps us from experiencing the life God intends for us. Here's one you can jot down. Fear is a prison where we are the jailer. Fear is a prison where we are the jailer. Number four, this is a biggie. Jesus knows your fears. Jesus knows your fears. You may have some huge fears. I don't know what they are. They may be consuming you. They may be stopping you. You may be drowning. You're wondering what's going to happen or what's not going to happen. This morning, I want to reassure you that whatever your fears are, Jesus knows those fears. I want you to think about the disciples when the disciples were on the water. Okay, I never looked at this text this way until this week. The disciples were out on the water. They lost sight of Jesus. But Jesus never lost sight of them. You got that? I don't know what you're caught up in. You may have lost sight of Jesus. The text says when Jesus saw them out there, when he realized they were out there, he knew they were out there, it says he saw them. He saw them struggling. If there's anything I can give you this morning to give you some peace, it's that. Jesus has got you covered. He knows where you're struggling. He knows what's scaring the tar out of you. But he's watching. He's watching. He's standing on the shores. He's watching every row of the boat you take. He's watching. He's never let you out of his sight. The question is, like the disciples, do you see him? And when he shows up, do you recognize him? If you're not seeing him and he shows up, do you recognize him? It's like the guy who was on the flood and the helicopter came by and he's standing on his roof and he wanted to be rescued and he said, no, I'm waiting for a boat. Right? You've all heard that story, right? Jesus shows up. And do you recognize him? Number five, I said Jesus knows your fears. This leads right into what I'm saying. Jesus is with you. Jesus is with you. If you consider the text, he wasn't just watching. He was there. There are so many texts in the Bible that talk about and show that Jesus is with us. But maybe none more specific than these. In Joshua, in 1 Kings, and in Hebrews, these words appear. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. If you're writing that down, underline, highlight, and circle 
never. If God doesn't seem present in the midst of your fears, guess who moved? Never will I leave you or forsake you. And when you recognize that Christ is present, when you recognize God is there, you begin to have greater faith, don't you? When you begin to step out in faith and you see God come through, doesn't it give you more confidence to go further? Come on. You're scared to death to deal with something, but once you deal with it, all of a sudden it gets a little easier and you become a little more bolder and you can row a little bit further out and take a little bit more chances, love a little more extravagantly, love a little more audaciously because you see God showing up. A wise person once said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. What are we afraid of? With God on our side, who could be against us? I want to go back to the words of Jesus because that's the authority that we listen to. The Bible, it's God's word that we trust and live by. Luke 4 verse 18, Jesus says this, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom from the fear is a prison. We are the jailers. Jesus came to set us free. He came to free the prisoner and the recovery of sight for the blind and to release the oppressed. Isn't that what Christmas is about? To set us free from sin and death and an old life? A life that we could never measure up to? A life that we could never be forgiven for? Didn't Jesus come at Christmas to give us a second chance, a rebirth, to set the prisoners free? We're going into more than just Thanksgiving. We're going into a season of Christmas. And what did the angel say? Fear not at Christmas. One of the gifts of Christmas is the freedom from fear. We make the choice to be free from it or not, accept it or not. Love does. Pastor Nate started off the series, said, love does because Christ did, because God did. Love does so that we might have life. I'm going to end this morning with this question. If fear, and maybe fear is a strong word, and it is, but maybe worry or extreme concern, maybe you want all the answers Sometimes we want to know how it's going to work out. We know what we want, and God is not delivering it that way. We want to know how it's going to work out. And we're afraid it's never going to happen, and we're scared to death. And we never move outside of our fear because we want the answers. And God says, that's not the life I came to give you. I came to set you free from that. God is saying, can you just trust me? Can you just walk with me? I love the word they use in the, in the, in the, uh, the old King James that always said, abide. Just abide. Some of you know that old hymn, Abide with Me. He calls us to abide, not fear. He calls us to abide. If fear, worry, or wanting all the answers is keeping you tied up at the dock, if fear is preventing you from going further or experiencing the life that Christ came to give you, then untie untie. We were made for adventure. We choose fear or faith. Fear or faith. Christ came to set us free from fear. He's with us. That should give us the faith. 
two words and an amen. Fear not. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this reminder this morning that you didn't create us to be filled with fear, but people who are created to live for you, to have not just an ordinary life, but an extraordinary life. Lord, I pray that you would just meet each of us where we're at. A simple message this morning, but one that probably strikes every one of us right in the heart, makes our heart beat, because we, deep down inside, have fear. There is stuff that scares the daylights out of us. Lord, I pray that you would take away those fears by showing up, just showing up in amazing ways. Give us grace. Give us peace. Give us the assurance of your presence to move forward knowing that you not only see us, but that you are with us. Help us to live out those words and fear not. Amen.